Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Rio Plus 20 is on. 20 years since the what was supposed to be ground-breaking global summit on what to do about the environment and climate change. And the question I guess many people are asking is, where is the sense of urgency that seemed to have been developing at least a decade ago? Now joining us from Rio is Patrick Bond. Patrick is the director of the Center for Civil Society and professor at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. He's also the author of the recently released books, Politics of Climate Change Justice and Durban's Climate Gamble. Thanks for joining us, Patrick. Great to be with you again, Paul. So you're in Rio. What's the, what's the mood and what are the expectations? In the streets, it is urgent and it's vibrant and it's very militant. And in uh, the Rio Centro official negotiating session, uh, as it's gotten going, it has, uh, according to the insiders, felt stagnant and stultified with, uh, with very little real power. The power, of course, being at the G20 uh, held this week in Mexico. Uh, and so without money, uh, all we have is Hillary Clinton flying in uh, today to announce a small fund for African energy, but very little else, perhaps some new sustainable development goals. I think the action really will be uh, in the streets, given the paralysis of the elites and the need for the 99% in the planet to really uh, step up the pressure. Now, the, uh, what do you make of what's happened in the arc of this? Uh, when President Obama was elected, uh, of course, the, the economic crisis was sharp and apocalyptic, we were told. And, uh, but a lot, there was a lot of talk about how the two worked together, that the kind of building of a new green economy was also going to be a form of solution to the crisis. Uh, you barely hear the words climate change anymore out of, of, of President Obama's mouth and certainly not out of Romney's mouth. Uh, but it's not just them. There used to be, it seemed, a lot more sense of urgency in Europe about this. And that also seems to have dissipated. What's your take on this? Well, it's that the economic crisis has given uh, much less room for maneuver on the kinds of financial commitments required, for example, to dramatically change our energy, our transport, our agricultural, our production, our consumption, our disposal systems. And without that uh, surplus to spread around and subsidize some renewable energy, public transport, of course, neither uh, Europe or the U.S. or uh, even Asian countries are doing enough uh, on the issue. And I would say uh, as well, Paul, that the attempts to use the markets and private corporations to solve problems created by the markets are failing, and there's no question about it. Even this week, the World Bank closed down one of their carbon trading funds, a major uh, fund of $150 million, because the price in Europe where these uh, third world investments are traded, they're called clean development mechanisms, has plummeted uh, down to about three euros uh, per ton of carbon, the, 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 the lowest ever. And that just means that the strategy called the green economy, which is to try to uh, invoke a market fix to a market problem, to internalize externalities, to get the prices right, as all of the rhetoric has it, it's simply not working. And so it's a very uh, a depressed scene if you're an elite because you know you're not really going to do much more than give some hot air here right. with some, maybe some new sustainable development goals to replace some millennial development goals. I mean, it's, it's part of the problem here is that when this thing was sort of catching on and you had like the Stern report coming from England and there was a, there was a lot of talk about how serious climate change was, that the, the, the sort of financial oligarchy jumped on this as another way to have more financialization and more financial instruments and another way just to make money out of this problem through various forms of speculation. And then when the financial crisis hits, the steam kind of goes out of that. My point being is that never for them was anything really about any basic change in the way we produce and do business. It was, it was a scheme and now they've got another scheme. Well, that's true, and the uh, uh, evidence of that is in Chicago, where the Chicago Climate Exchange uh, closed down, and the, the man who founded it, Richard Sander, is being sued by his former associates for fraud. And so you see the sort of thieves pulling out the knives on each other. Um, meanwhile, those who probably meant well by promoting the green economy in its early days, for example, where I was 10 years ago, Rio Plus 10, Johannesburg, we saw the first signs of this of this sort of green economy rhetoric, uh, type two partnerships, public-private partnerships, water privatization was all the rage, uh, carbon trading was getting into swing. There's people like Al Gore um, who went to Kyoto in 1997 and said, look, the U.S. will support this climate initiative if you allow us to trade and to our corporations to keep polluting if they can buy somebody else's right. And of course, the U.S. Senate voted 95 to nothing against 
leaving Gore rather embarrassed, but even major environmental groups are continuing. Last week, WWF and Greenpeace even uh, launched a report to promote carbon trading to try to save the European scheme. So it's, it's gotten a lot of people down a slippery slope to believing uh, that the green economy is, is efficient and effective when in fact uh, the market investments that we've seen require huge subsidies and uh, still aren't delivering the goods. And that means the people in the street, Paul, I think are quite correct to say we're fed up and uh, we've had about uh, 30,000 people out protesting uh, a couple of days ago um, and in fact the night before uh, a warm-up protest that was very militant uh, by the movement of the landless workers, MST it's called here in Brazil. They had about 3,000 and throwing uh, eggs uh, filled with uh, with red paint at the white headquarters of Vale, a huge Rio-based mining company. Uh, we've also seen uh, at the opening session uh, indigenous people marching up 500 and they weren't allowed in uh, to have representatives. It took quite a long time of negotiating. And then we had the first Occupy Summit led by youth from Canada, Bill McKibben of 350.org there. And that's the kind of pressure we need, both a little bit on that inside, but I think more and more to give up on the inside and to do things on the outside where the real power has got to be built. And uh, wh what kind of specific demands then are people making for solutions? If the things like carbon trading and all the various financialization of this is, is, is not only is the steam out of it, but it was probably a dead end to begin with in terms of really solving the problem. What, what specific proposals are people making? Well, if you go to any one of the different environmental sectors, uh, for example, uh, saving species from extinction, uh, halting the fresh water privatization led by uh, the Council of uh, Canadians Blue Planet Project, uh, or ocean uh, and, and marine, uh, saving the marine, or, or for example, in the climate, uh, Cochabamba Climate Justice Conference of April 2010, still uh, being, I think, a very, very strong statement, up-to-date demands to close the carbon markets and demand instead financing through a climate debt mechanism, something, by the way, that Hillary Clinton had sort of promised in Copenhagen and isn't following through on. Uh, the U.S. delegation here, by the way, is notorious, even worse, people are saying, than George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992, you may remember he said, the American way of life is not up for negotiation. And even worse than George W. Bush. And the reason is that with such an economic crisis, it appears that Obama's chief negotiator here, Todd Stern from the State Department, has really been pressured, uh, perhaps by uh, the Treasury, just to not give any uh, grounds on uh, the equity uh, area. And the, the, the whole uh, phrase from the first Rio, which is uh, for uh, more equity and, and, and a differentiated, a common but different, differentiated responsibility, the U.S. is resisting. And I think that means that the kind of crowd that we've been seeing developing critiques, especially at a huge people summit, there must have been tens of thousands of people from all over the world coming through this alternative Copula dos Povos held uh, in central Rio. That really is where a sort of a much richer spirit that transcends any of the um, rather stale and irrelevant negotiations going on in Rio Center. That really is where the future is being uh, built, it seems to me, Paul. But, but at the state level, there, there had been some division, at north-south division, that the southern countries, especially those most affected by climate change, uh, you know, wanted something real. And is, is there any of that kind of fight taking place now in Rio? Well, I must be frank that state to state, those who were dissidents, uh, for example, Bolivia, under a lot of pressure, have pulled back. And in Durban, the Bolivian delegation, without their former chief negotiator, Pablo Salon, uh, was much, much weaker than before. But, you know, uh, thanks to Bradley Manning, allegedly, and, and Julian Assange, uh, the WikiLeaks documents have shown us just how uh, pernicious the U.S. State Department can be. And that is bribing small countries like the Maldives, uh, about to go underwater, uh, with uh, just $50 million to do a U-turn and support the U.S. position, the so-called Copenhagen Accord. Uh, same for the Ethiopian, Malasanawi, that leader again, WikiLeaks revealed uh, the State Department cables suggest very easily manipulated. So we, we shouldn't really expect third world elites because they're basically co-opted from all the evidence so far. Uh, and it may be that there is some internecine struggles going on between the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. But as we saw again in the G20 in Mexico, 
they all line up fairly clearly behind the uh, Washington Brussels project. That was particularly evident in terms of the bailout of the IMF, four hundred and thirty billion dollars that the IMF is now receiving, including a hundred billion from the BRICS. So I don't really see any break in uh, interstate tensions, although there are obviously a, a lot. I mean, the most important perhaps is that the green economy may not proceed as far as. Uh, northern uh, uh, corporations would like because uh, southern uh, governments and China is especially strong have put a little bit of a resistance but I think I could conclude Paul, by saying that the green economy rhetoric will be with us for quite some time and it's so crucial for us to distinguish between those progressives who want uh, the debt that the North owes the South for taking ecological space, carbon space, polluting too much to be paid. That is for massive damage the North is doing to the South to be paid. And that could be through states, but also directly. Um, and that's a lot different than the way in which the green economy is being posed, which is payment for environmental services. I mean, uh, and it's Patrick, very, when you use the term green economy, you're using green free market economy. Some people are using the term green economy to mean public investment in developing green economy. Uh, and, and indeed, that's where the money should go, if there were justice. And if we had a movement for genuine green jobs, uh, we'd see the labor movement really backing a shift out of fossil fuel addicted industry. Unfortunately, there's a very small group. There's a million climate jobs campaign in Britain, also in South Africa, it's just getting started in the US. Uh, but these are still on the margins. And unfortunately, this whole rhetoric of green economy, payment for environmental services, and financial securitization of nature, selling rights to pollute effectively. Uh, that's still being controlled by the elites. And, and so this countervailing pressure that we see on the streets in Rio, and we see in all manner of experiments, is still only beginning to eat away at the problem. And all I can say is that the uh, solutions that the elites have, that is, uh, with the market uh, answer to the kind of crises really created by the markets, that's simply not working and it's not going to work. And so that means we'll all be, I think, increasingly pressured uh, on one side or the other of this huge divide of whether nature should be subject to market forces uh, to take a stand. And for those in the South, I know they're saying the North must pay the ecological debt, but Northern corporations mustn't be able to uh, invoke land grabs or um, uh, patented uh, uh, you know, biopiracy or, or uh, uh, capture of the commons, privatization and so forth. That's the kind of green economy that a corporate might have in mind, but that people will resist. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for joining us, Patrick, and we'll come back to you, I guess, towards the end of Rio and uh, catch up on where things are at then. Great to be with you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.